So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, IPA colloquium. Uh, India, IPA, the Indian Physics Association, was founded in 1970 with a goal to help the advancement, dissemination, and application of knowledge of physics. The idea is to provide a platform for the physics community and the young people who are interested in physics research. This is achieved by publication of bulletins. The Physics News is the quarterly news bulletin, which is published by the Physics News, and uh, arranging several lectures, special programs, particularly for students and young researchers. So some of the special lectures IPA organizes are the DAE CV Raman lecture series. Uh, IPA also liaises with other international sister organizations like Institute of Physics UK, American Physical Society, uh, AAPPS, that is Association of Asia-Pacific Physical Societies, and the national bodies like academy, uh, science academies. This kind of gives a small, uh, the figure here gives you a kind of a overview of uh, the IPA's reach within the country, and we uh, using the online platform, we have made special efforts to organize lectures in the different parts of the country. You can get more information about IPA on the web page and uh, the uh, physics news bulletin is also available online. So the current office bearers of IPA are, if I can move the slide, I'll show you, yeah. So Prasayas Ramakrishnan, uh, Director TIFR is the president of IPA. Professor Tanushri Sahadas Gupta, Director SN Bose Centre Kolkata, is Vice President. Myself, Vandana Nanal, is uh, General Secretary. Professor Samit Mandal from Delhi University is Joint Secretary. Dr. Aradhana Srivastava from BRC is um, Treasurer. And in 2017, IPA set up the Gender in Physics Working Group to address the gender equity problem in uh, physics profession in India. And Professor Shubhavati Goswami PRL is the current chair of the uh, gender group. We are particularly happy today to have this colloquium by Professor Poonam Chandra, uh, your own very, uh, uh, your own very uh, personal scientist. And uh, as you many of you know, that February 11 was declared by United Nations as the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. 8th March is International Day of Women. And on this occasion, we thought it was really nice to hear from Poonam in her own words, her journey and what she does. So IPS uh, welcomes all the viewers, both in participants in Zoom and on YouTube for this colloquium. And we are thankful to um, uh, Dayalbag Educational Institute, Department of Physics and Computer Science for hosting this colloquium. So over to you, Professor Sukhdev Rai. So, um... The Dalbagh Educational Institute is a deemed to be university, which was established in 1981. And uh, it actually focuses on the all round development of an individual, even at the university level. So that makes uh, it very uh, different from other universities. The Department of Physics and Computer Science offers a variety of UG and PG programs in physics, electronics, and computer science. The unique combination of the expertise of the faculty members of the department enables cutting edge research in multidisciplinary and even transdisciplinary areas that include quantum information, nanoscience, neurophotonics, neuromorphic devices, microwave devices, uh, neurofuzzy systems, image processing and decision support systems, astrophysics, high energy physics, string theory, cognitive science, and even science of consciousness. We have uh, collaborative research programs and MOUs with prestigious universities that include Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Michigan State University, uh, University of Waterloo in Canada, University of Kiel in Germany, and National Institutes for Material Science, Cuba, Japan. And in India, we have uh, very active collaborations with TIFR, JNCASR, NPL, IUAC, New Delhi, IIT Delhi, and IIT Kanpur. We offer joint courses in computer science and have joint PhD supervision with faculties in these institutes. Our outstanding faculty and students have received many awards and recognitions, uh, one of them being Professor Poonam Chandra, a distinguished alumnus of her department. I'm very happy and proud that she's delivering the IPA colloquium today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for giving such a brief and a apt 
uh, outline of the institute i am here to introduce the speaker uh, professor poonam chandra as you all know she is our honor student and after completing her honors she went for a post graduation in physics from aligarh muslim university and then she completed her phd in tifr under the program a uh, joint collaboration with indian institute of science in 2005 she won the insa young scientist award for her work in 2006 and after her phd she was selected for her postdoc or uh, at the national radio astronomy observatory in the university of virginia where she worked from 2005 to 2008 since 2008 she was in canada and uh, she was a professor a young professor in the royal military college of canada and um, during her postdoc she was awarded the iupap young scientist award and she's been at ncra tfr since 2012 where she now is an associate professor and during this period she was also a recipient of the swarn jayanti fellowship 2016 to 2021 and of course there are many more accolades in her uh, uh, basket but then her today's aim of her talk is more on focusing on the supernovas and gamma ray bursts and uh, just to connect with her talk we are trying to see cosmic rays coming uh, through these sources in the institute by we just set up a d array in the institute it's a mini array with collaboration with cosmic ray lab uti only which is your which is io neighbor uh, ncra is also there in uti you have another branch there so welcome uh, professor poonam chandra and uh, let's hear you now thank you <coughs> uh thank you dr sonali and thank you so much professor roy for such uh, kind information uh, uh, kind introduction so first of all i really would like to thank ipa uh, for uh, asking me to give this talk and i am more thrilled that ip arranged for dei uh, my alma mater to organize this talk and i'm really thrilled to see uh, you know professor roy who is the only one who taught me in this uh, crowd uh but i would like to also say since we are talking about the alba that i was equally interested or maybe slightly more interested in maths than physics when i was doing my bsc and i didn't think i'll take physics but then uh, uh professor rao had a had a trick and he introduced me to five one lectures on physics and once i read those lectures i think i i changed the course of my interest and i'm not regretting ever since but uh, so whatever i'll be talking about today uh, major uh, major motivation goes to you sir uh, for introducing i had not heard of five one lectures before i met you so thank you thank so you is... very proud of you <laughs> thank you so much and i must i must just add one line and that is that um, you know in, in my career of 30 years you were the your class was the first one when i started teaching in 1993 and poonam is not uh, a, a brilliant student or an academician but she is in round personality good very outstanding you know she is an excellent artist uh, excellent in extracurricular activities and social service so she uh, is a really good human being so we are very proud of you poonam and let's <laughs> go to your talk thank you thank you so much i am really really honored to hear this from you uh, anyway without <laughs> any further ado i'll start my talk so i'm going to start sharing my screen and if you cannot see then please let me know but uh, yeah it's i visible. hope you okay mm -hmm. uh, i hope you can see this very beautiful animation also which is of course not uh, by me it's by nasa uh, but it does show the stars which i will be talking about and uh, and before talking about these exotic massive stars and their even more exotic deaths let's let's talk about our neighborhood star that is our own sun and i think by now many of us uh, know that uh, the sun is giving us energy which is responsible for our survival is because hydrogen is burning into helium and that is releasing some energy and that energy is what comes to us so while sun is a very special star for us uh, in the big scheme or let's say in milky way uh, sun is one of the very average star uh, it's called in this hr diagram hertzsprung russell diagram which i'll come to in a second 
sun occupies this very very uh, you know uh, insignificant place and uh, what is hr diagram so our milky way our galaxy consists of some 100 billion stars and if you if you take all of these stars and rearrange these stars with intensity and temperature moving increasing towards the left and the place these every single of these stars occupy in this plot is called hr diagram of stars and i must say that hr diagram or hertzsprung russell diagram is probably the most important diagram in stellar astronomy so let's just take uh, one moment and see what this hr diagram is so in hr diagram there is only one principle it works on that is called stefan boltzmann law where the luminosity of the star will be square of the size of the star and 4 to the power of the temperature of the star so you can imagine that if size is bigger temperature is higher the star will be brighter now this main uh, line in this is called mean sequence stars and these are the sun like stars but with different ma masses what does that mean is that these stars are uh, burning hydrogen into the helium and releasing the energy and the mass of the star uh, increases from right bottom right to top left but you can see some other stars also uh, these are giants and name uh, appropriately named so because if you see these stars in the yellow these stars have this in the same luminosity which means to but they are much colder then the main main star counterpart main sequence counterpart it means to have the same kind of luminosity their size has to go up to compensate for the uh, 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 down uh, for the lower temperature similarly you see these other dwarf stars and here the temperature is much higher so if the luminosity is of their counterpart main sequence stars are same it means the size has to go much much smaller to compensate uh, for the uh, for the increased uh, temperature and these white dwarfs are of the of the mass of uh, one tenth or one fifth of the sun but they are of the size of our own earth so in this uh, hr diagram our sun uh, so these giants and white dwarfs whatever i said these represent different evolutionary stages of uh, star for example our sun will move something like this uh, in this stage and sun is having a very long life it is already lived for four and a half billion years it has another four and a half to five billion years to live and then it will become a white dwarf uh, at this end point but sun is not the star we are interested in today uh, so let's not go there let's go to the stars which we are interested these are the more massive stars very very massive stars the stars which are more than at least two three times uh, more massive than sun and uh, they are called o and b kind of stars so this is what we will be talking today so uh, i would like to come to these stars one thing is the nuclear synthesis <clears throat> for example i we will come to this that inside star hydrogen is burning into helium but there are other in massive stars advanced nuclear synthesis is also happening there is also something which is very important which is called magnetic field in the star and another thing is binarity in the star so we will be picking here uh, one aspect which is magnetic field and that's because some of the very very exotic objects in our universe these are called magnetars and magnetic white dwarfs they could be connected to these uh, magnetic stars and if you uh, if you study stellar evolution you will realize that these massive stars are not supposed to have any magnetic field because their outer layers are very radiative but what we have seen in the survey of stars in our own galaxy milky way that we know that 10% of these stars are massive uh, stars are magnetic stars and how they uh, change the evolution is something we are wondering into and i have um, my fantastic student bernali has worked on this and she just finished her thesis just uh, defended few months ago and she is now in us for her postdoc and she carried out really good work in this field so in this field let's just um, how did we study this uh, these stars so let's here in this electromagnetic spectrum what you see in the yellow is the visible light our eyes are sensitive to or the traditional way astronomy has been done so far for hundreds of years but we can make full use of electromagnetic um, spectrum and i want to concentrate on the radio part of the spectrum which is on the leftmost longest wavelength two reasons 
if we see in our universe uh, radio continuum emission is mostly synchrotron and synchrotron is a proxy for magnetic fields so radio emission is best probe of the magnetic field of the stars and since we are talking about the magnetic stars so let's study them in radio band second is that uh, radio provides a complementary information for example if you see this this uh, Uh, this picture on the left is an optical image of the same part of the galaxy uh, same part of the sky and on the right you see the radio image and you see while the optical looks uh, very very insignificant and nothing exciting is happening you see a very different kind of source on the radio it means there was some information which we were missing and by studying the in the different band of electromagnetic spectrum we can get a more comprehensive picture of our universe uh third is the transparent to atmosphere so uh, i think uh, what i would like to say is that we know that uh, we can see with our eyes optical we can see stars it means the optical rays do reach us but if you have to see the uh, radiation in x rays or gamma rays we have to go beyond earth's atmosphere because these are absorbed by our atmosphere but radio in this part is is a window which is transparent to uh, earth's atmosphere what that means is that we can build radio telescopes on our planet and try to study astrophysical phenomena in the radio band which is not possible in say x ray or gamma rays or other wavelengths so so radio does provide a cheaper way to study uh, uh, astronomical objects but there is a problem with radio astronomy if you see on the left side uh, it's a picture of moon with a 10 cm optical telescope If you see on the right, there is a picture of Moon with one third of a kilometer diameter radio telescope. Its name is Arecibo, and the reason why this picture looks on the radio is looks so uh, bloody is because uh, resolution is wavelength over diameter, and we know that the radio wavelengths are so 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 large. that you need to have very very huge diameter of the mirrors for example if you want to get the same sharpness as on the left with a radio telescope you may have to build some 30 40 kilometer uh, size of uh, antenna and which is really very very difficult or of course next to impossible to do so so how does radio astronomy done it's called radio interferometry the idea is that rather than having one big 30 kilometer dish we will build many 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 small dishes and we will uh, proxy these small dishes as one big uh, mirror of 30 km but even that is expensive these are some hundreds of dishes you have to build to get a, a you know good uh, mirror so what we do we do uh, is this is called aperture uh, synthesis so we only have dishes in this y kind of array and we utilize the fact that earth is taking 24 hours to rotate so it means the when uh, you are looking from the ground these sources will seem to change their position in the sky so if you observe these objects for few some uh, long time few hours you will have you will would have proxied for that mirror with many many more uh, you know proxy meet mirror and this is called radio uh, interferometry and aperture synthesis and i'm extremely proud to tell you that we do have one such radio telescope in our country this is called giant meter wave radio telescope uh, conceived and built by professor gobind swarup who unfortunately uh, passed away in september 2020 and this telescope if you see closely because you may not probably able to make sense out of it this telescope is this is uh, the dishes from close by there are 30 such antennas spread over 25 km diameter each this antenna you can see here is 45 meters in diameter so this telescope is around 80 km from pune and it is have it uh, works on the wavelength of 20 to 200 cm and currently it is one of the most sensitive and biggest radio telescope in the world and it is doing some really one world class research uh, in the radio astronomy so uh, here if you uh, look at this antenna so here aperture synthesis is happening you can see this antenna this is moving and tracking the source in the sky it means you know so that's how it is providing this coverage of a uh, you know and all the antennas are tracking in the similar way so that that's what provides the coverage of uh, radio interferometry and aperture synthesis i was talking about one of the things you may be wondering is that why these antenna dishes are transparent 
well they are actually not transparent uh, the reason is that our eyes are uh, sensitive to optical wavelengths and optical wavelengths are much smaller for example i'm giving you this example of nice example of a sieve where you can see that if you have these small granules they will go through the sieve but these big concretes will not go through the sieve so for these big concretes the sieve is still opaque it's not transparent so same thing happens uh, optical wavelengths are much much smaller than radio wavelengths so for radio wavelengths these dishes are not transparent at all but for our optical eyes uh, they are of course looking transparent so these these dishes are not transparent so this is how the antenna works and uh, we have studied radio emission of the stars so for example this is a star which is surrounded by this plasma and in this plasma electrons in the presence of particles will produce something called Bramstrahlung emission and something like that you can see in frequency and intensity plane. But what happens when you introduce a magnetic field in these stars? When you introduce a magnetic field, you see gyrosynchrotron emission because there are magnetic fields, so electrons spiraling in the presence of magnetic field will produce gyrosynchrotron. And this will seem modulated just because the axis at which the star is rotating and the magnetic poles are not aligned. So you will see this uh, modulated kind of emission. But here, electrons are uh, in the vicinity of ion and they are producing gyrosynchron. But what happens in some cases, electrons collectively decide to work together. And what happens is that they come in phase and then they produce the emission. And this stage where they come in phase happens very close to the poles. And at these poles, the electrons are in coherency and then this uh, they will produce. And since this is along the pole around the magnetic nulls, you will see these big spikes, which are called coherent emission. And this is what uh, Bernali has studied. And she has taken this field uh, way forward where it already was. So this is uh, one of the, uh, sorry, this is, yes. Mm, I'm sorry, I have to go again because I think I goofed up. And all right. So here I want to show you, this is a star. This is a B type star. This was the first star which showed this coherent emission and this happened in the year 2000. And then for nearly two decades, there was no second star with coherent emission and this field was pretty much, you know, uh, dead, you can say. But Bernali joined me for her PhD and she discovered 11 more such stars with the GMRT. And uh, in addition to our discoveries, other people also discovered, uh, you know, some more new stars. So currently out of 15 such stars which are showing this very exotic coherent emission, 11 have been discovered by us. And since we discovered many of these, we have named them main sequence radio pulse emitters or MRPs. Now, one can do some really exotic physics with these kind of stars. Uh, one of the things is, for example, uh, one. Uh, this is one of the uh, plot I am showing of these stars which uh, uh, we have discovered. And there are you know, some more of such stars which we have discovered. And we have also studied the, them in many, many wavelengths, radio wavelengths, to see where the electron, this, this coherent emission electron cyclotron laser emission starts and where it ends and those kind of things. So what have we achieved with this exercise? One is since a different frequency emission comes from a different height, one can understand the magnetic topology or magnetic field topology of the star which is quite important. This is the most sensitive way to understand the magnetic fields of these stars. Plasma density. So this, uh, this is a work done by Bernali and another student of NCRA along with me. And in this star, they, uh, they have shown or we have shown is that if the density is symmetric, you will have this very nice on the top, this, uh, the coherent emission. But if the density is asymmetric and it's, uh, you know, you will have all sorts of uh, these kind of emissions. So by studying these profiles, one can try to understand the density in the innermost part of the star, which is not accessible by any other means. Uh, also here, you can say that since this uh, emission is supposed to have uh, be at the magnetic nulls, and if you take the observations, say in this case, few years apart, if you can see that this null is moving, it means the rotation period of star is changing. So this becomes a proxy to see the change in rotation period of the star, 
uh, as you can see, this uh, these peaks are much much brighter than the gy gyrosynchrotron. It means this gives gives us a hope to detect them in uh, in other galaxies than our Milky Way also. And um, since we don't know the uh, uh, origin of magnetic field, these stars whether they're coming from their surrounding or they're coming from other merger processes or whatever is happening. Uh, by studying them, maybe at some point we will start to understand the origin of the magnetic field. And um, we are also trying to understand, so this is my another PhD student, Ayan Vishwas is working on this. He is working on binarity of these magnetic stars. And he has already made this discovery of this very modulated radio emission with, along with these two peaks. And so we are uh, studying further uh, on these stars. This work has just started. And all of this will allow us to probe a new parameter space because in this plot, which is the radio uh, is transient space, you can see the blue one is called the incoherent emission and the, the white one is called coherent emission, but our stars lie somewhere in the crossing the boundary. So this is a parameter space we need to study. So now coming after the magnetic stars, let me just go to the even more exotic depths of these stars. And I'm talking about these biggest stars and let's just take example of our Betelgeuse. Uh, Betelgeuse is a star. So if you can see in this uh, animation, this is our sun. And this is the Mercury's orbit, Venus orbit, Earth's orbit, Mars orbit. And uh, this is Jupiter orbit, and this is the size of Betelgeuse. You can imagine how big this star is. Uh, you know, it is reaching to uh, Jupiter's uh, orbit. So it is really a big star. And at some point, the star is going to explode. So what is happening and why this star is exploding? And that is a very interesting aspect to understand. So uh, this is what I had shown you in the HR diagram. This was the track sun would have followed to become a white dwarf. But Betelgeuse kind of star uh, is an is a evolutionary uh, phase in the main sequence star, which will go through this red giant phase and then eventually explode. And that depends upon the nucleosynthesis. For example, this star, a main sequence star sitting here, burning hydrogen into helium. And when all the hydrogen is exhausted, it becomes a big red supergiant kind of star. Now this red supergiant will uh, further undergo many nuclear stages of burning hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, neon, oxygen, iron, and finally it will explode. And uh, another thing I want to tell you is that while our sun is four and a half billion years old, Betelgeuse, which has already left this main sequence uh, phase, is only uh, 10, 12 million years old. So what is happening? This star uh, is having so much of fuel and that it is burning at a very, very accelerated rate. On the left, the, what you see the explosion is what is happening is that when there, it is, the star is going through these advanced nuclear burning stages. Now, a star has all of these heavy elements inside it and it is going through, but when it reaches to the iron stage, it cannot burn any, any further. And then uh, there is not, no more nuclear fusion going on. And before that, what was happening, the energy, the photons, which were coming out in this nuclear fusion, were compensating the gravitational pull because of which the star would have contracted. But if you see this uh, again here, once it, uh, the iron inert core is formed, the star, the center of the star will collapse under its own gravity, the whole star will collapse. And at some point, the center density is so much, which we call a neutron star, that rest of the thing will hit this ball and uh, move away. And you can imagine that this, this ejecta, this ejecta is having all of these heavier material which were formed inside the star. And these heavier material were scattered on the, in the atmosphere or in the uh, medium by this explosion. And every single element in our body, the oxygen you're breathing right now, the, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your teeth, the aluminum in your car, everything was built inside these massive stars and then with the supernova explosions, these were spread in the environment. And then when the new star like our sun took uh, form, these stars had this, our solar system had much more heavier elements that so that the life, I uh, know we could survive, uh, we could, uh, otherwise uh, this was not possible, right? So this is every single element 
needed for our survival was created inside the supernova. Uh, of course, there are some more heavier elements which I'll come to in a, in a while. So why do we want to study the supernova explosion? Because they are really challenging our view of the universe. They derive the galactic evolution. They have uh, chemically enriching the universe. They are extremely energetic even. For example, if you, I give you an example, Milky Way, which has 100 billion stars, this one supernova explosion will be as bright as this Milky Way of 100 billion stars. This kind of energy, uh, uh, my apologies, the astronomers work in CGS units, not SI units, but uh, so 10 to the power 51 nuts, which will be 10 to the power 44 joules. Uh, this energy is around 29 orders of magnitude larger than the nuclear explosion uh, one can do on Earth. So these are really, really huge energies. And in these uh, explosions, the velocities, the supersonic velocities, the electrons, uh, which have only 511 kilo electron would rest mass, they reach to GeV and higher energies. The magnetic fields are super high and such supernovae are happening around four to eight supernovae every second in the universe and enriching our universe with so many uh, chemical elements. Metals, we call anything above helium, we call it metals. So enriching the helium, uh, universe with metals. So these are some of the supernovae remnants in our galaxy on the top. These are images taken by Chandra X-ray telescope, which is a NASA telescope. At the bottom, you are seeing a uh, crab supernova remnant on the leftmost it's showing the constellation Taurus where it's is there in the middle there is this um, Chinese record of the supernova and that tells us that it happened in 10,054 and on the right the kind of explosion which must have produced the cap crab supernova so I am just showing you a cartoon image of the supernovae so how do we study these supernovae uh, if you see, follow this arrow, you can actually see in real time the intensity of the star is changing. This is actually a supernova. And this supernova, when we study the light curve and the spectrum, we can understand that what elements were formed inside this star and uh, whatever uh, chemical abundance is there. So this is pretty amazing. But the problem is that we don't understand which stars explode as supernovae. And that is uh, something which we want to understand. And our group is trying very hard to understand uh, the supernovae and which stars will form which kind of supernovae. Because there are, believe me, at least 20 or more types of supernovae. And each supernovae have unique property. And we don't understand that. So how, what, how are we trying to understand? So take this. This is a star. Suppose this is a star which is 10 solar mass. The star is losing its mass, the outermost layer, because they are less gravitationally bound. So you can see in the uh, there is a medium surrounding this star. Now this medium uh, is carrying the footprints of the star, right? Because this star is the one losing its outermost mass. Now the explosion happens, and this explosion happens in this environment. Now if I can study this environment via this explosion. I can understand, I can trace the footprints of this star. And this is what we call uh, circumstellar interaction studies of supernovae. So here, this is actually the previous diagram, but in a much nicer and cartoon way. So this is the explosion center. This is the explosion ejector, which happened. This is the wind, the gray area. And then when the, uh, the, wind, the explosion ejector hit the wind, it is creating a forward and a reverse shock. And the shocks are so hot that it creates a very, very high energy X-ray emission, which is uh, which we study with many telescopes, which we have currently. Uh, 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 they, these all telescopes are in the sky. Bec uh, sorry, it's, it's beyond our Earth. They are revolving around the Earth. And the reason for this is that X-rays will be absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So, so these telescopes have to go beyond. And these are run by NASA, ESO, and Caltech. These are called New Star, Chandra, Swift, and XMM. These are the X-ray telescope. Uh, another thing which we are trying to do with our GMRT and some other world-class telescopes is understanding the supernovae in radio band. That's because we are trying to understand uh, how, uh, how we can understand the properties of the star which exploded after the supernova explosion, go back in time. And since radio emission is synchrotron in nature, uh, it provides us a best way to understand. So let's just see what I'm, when I'm saying that radio uh, imaging provides us a time machine 
of these uh, supernovae. So what I'm seeing on the left, you have at the center is the explosion ejecta surrounding. This is the wind which was uh, released by this star itself. So now imagine if I uh, study the ejecta when it has moved. Remember, ejecta is moving with supersonic speed. I am probing this wind here. Now, if I study after some more time, I am probing the wind here, which was released much before uh, the explosion. This was released just before the explosion. And this was released way before the, uh, the explosion. And this is possible in only radio band because radio is synchrotron emission. All of this emission coming is synchrotron emission because there is magnetic field in these shocks. And there's, uh, there is this relativistic electron, which is giving rise to this magnetic, uh, relativistic uh, magnetic emission, synchrotron emission. Now I want to say that uh, typically the wind speed is, uh, sorry, shock speed, uh, sorry, I should have done upside down. The shock speed is 10,000 kilometers per second and wind speed is 10 kilometers per second. It means the ratio is 1,000. What does that mean? That means that if I study this one day after the explosion, I am going back 1,000 days before the explosion. So I am somewhere in the oxygen fusion regime. regime. I can study how the progenitor was evolving when it was making, uh, uh, doing the oxygen fusion. If I suppose study one year uh, after the explosion, I'm probing 1,000 uh, years before the explosion. So I'm probing somewhere in between this regime. If I see this say 10 years uh, later, then I'm probing somewhere in this regime. It means if I can study these uh, supernovae in radio band, I can literally create the history of the progenitor. And this is what we have been doing with the GMRT. And uh, one of the things which these progenitor histories are sensitive to, which was not available earlier with other telescope was this low frequency because GMRT is an excellent telescope at low frequency. And you can see from this low frequency, we, ha we have to catch this rising part of the spectra and the light curve to understand the environments and progenitor densities. And you can see that none of the data, these are real data with the GMRT, none of the data looks as smooth as this cartoon diagram on the left most. That's because the cow is not a sphere and there is no eyes on the sphere. The cow is the cow and we have to understand that we have to make the proper modeling and we have been able to do with the GMRT. And what I had shown you earlier, this image, a very nice circumstellar interaction image, it is not like that. In fact, we have seen that this medium has a lot of lumps and bumps and you know inhomogeneities, and the density profiles are not not at all uh, normal. That density is going up and down, as you can see the uh, this green uh, curve. The density is really not smooth. So we have seen a lot of these kind of things, and we have been able to try to understand, make a realistic picture of the supernovae. Other thing which GMRT observations have told us is that, so this is again our crab nebula and crab will explode. And as I said, this will make a very, very uh, something at the center of the star, which is called remnant of the star, okay? The properties of this central part depends upon, decides the energy and velocity of the ejecta. And if you have the radio data, by fitting at the peak, you can get the velocity of the ejector, which is producing the uh, this radio emission and also the magnetic field. Now, what I'm showing you is a real data again. Uh, the blue ones are a telescope at a higher frequency. It's called VLA, very large array, and the red ones are the GMRT. So if you did not have the GMRT data, and if you do the synchrotron model fitting, this is what you will fit at the peak and the velocity will be much smaller. But if you had the, since you had the GMRT data, you can have a proper fit and then you will have get a uh, correct estimate of the velocity. And why that is crucial? Because as I said, what kind of central part or remnant is there is decide what kind of velocity, what kind of energetics the supernova will have. These are ordinary supernovae. They are very high energy supernovae and this is somewhere in between. So we need to determine these velocity parameters very, very correctly. And so we have been, these are again our GMRT data and we have been able to uh, do it not just at one epoch, we have been able to see the evolution of the velocity. Other thing is nature of the supernova progenitor. Again, this I'm, I'm showing the synchrotron plot again and again, but this is how a synchrotron plot will go in time along with this arrow. 
but look at this data here this one should have gone like this but it did not go like this it went like this so what happened here what happened is this cartoon picture happened so this is what the shock is moving and the shock moved and then it became optically thin we could see inside there is another shock which is there which is much more dense and why that happened so we understand so this was a very special kind of supernova so this is how a, a star which will explode the structure looks i just not told you this because of nuclear synthesis but this star was such that the outermost hydrogen layer was gone from the star the outermost helium layer was gone and this was a naked very very hot star which exploded and people have been trying to understand how can a star lose whole of its hydrogen and helium envelope and when we saw this picture then we could understand that because we are seeing these two shocks it is probably a binary system where there are these two massive stars and the more massive star explodes as supernova this creates a neutron star at the center and since the neutron star is very close to this other star the neutron star goes here this star uh, allows it to shed its outermost mass and explodes as a supernova so it's a very complicated picture but uh, this is how this whole data fits very nicely in this manner so it means we have been able to identify what kind of supernova what kind of stars will have at kind of supernova now let's come to something um, uh, very different which is called gamma ray bursts so on your left i have shown you this animation again and again a uh, nearly spherical explosion is happening and everything is uh, scattered in the medium and this is creating a neutron star at the center but this does not happen all the time what happens in some cases when the star is much more massive what happens at the center it is not a neutron star which forms it is actually a black hole which forms and then there is a matter surrounding the black hole which forms an accretion disk and along that uh, perpendicular to that accretion disk this explosion happens so the same explosion happened but now this all of these explosion ejecta came in this very 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 narrow window it's like uh you can you can assume with the light of a bulb versus a laser light so this is since it is so collimated it is only in very only if it is looking towards us is pointing towards us then only we can see and that's why these gamma ray bursts was discovered very very late uh, we didn't know about these bursts before 1970 and on the left i am showing you a real burst profile what does this tell you this tells us that these bursts last only for a few seconds but if you look at the left uh, uh, side this is a universe in gamma rays and in this gamma ray band this one such burst of explosion of one star say 20 30 solar mass will outshine rest of the universe in gamma ray bands these bursts are seen in gamma rays so these are the most energetic explosions we know after the big bang and they last for a very very little time but in that little time nothing can shine brighter than these uh, burst in our universe and they outshine the universe so uh, here what you are seeing is a telescope named fermi which is and this each position is a position of a gamma ray burst so what why this uh, plot is significant is that since on the left you are seeing gamma rays are there only for a few second in some cases only for a few millisecond how do you look for them in the sky second is that how do you uh, you know find which direction they are in the sky because their gamma rays are so hard to focus so for 30 years people did not know that what gamma ray bursts are literally till 1990 um seven we did not know what gamma ray bursts are but what we knew this plot on the right that they are distributed uh, everywhere in the sky so they will probably not coming from our own milky way galaxy then they will have a biased distribution they are coming from far away places so that is what we knew and finally some telescopes lot of telescopes were launched and currently there are two main telescopes fermi and swift telescopes so they have these uh, they are just revolving around the sky uh, around the earth and they're just looking for these burst and the moment they detect the burst since they are just so short burst there are these robotic telegrams which are sent and astronomers like us who are interested in this field we uh, subscribe to these 
uh, telegrams and we get it on our emails, our cell phones, and then we can try to observe them at other wavebands because observing them at other wavebands is much easier than uh, looking them in the gamma rays and because they are called afterglows uh, because they are at a lower frequency. And again, this is synchrotron emission in all the bands and on the right, you are seeing this very nice, you know, uh, the, the jet is moving and then it is producing synchrotron. And this is a very nice uh, uh, diagram. But let me just say, say whatever nice diagram I'm showing you in this talk, our artist conception, because we can't see <laughs> in so much detail. This is a real, uh, you know, this is expectation. And this is actually the real image of this gamma ray burst you can see this bright point uh, bright becoming bright and light and so on that's because um, this is the real burst and this is so far away from us that this light from this burst left us seven billion years ago that is before even our earth was formed solar system was formed it means it left seven billion years ago and that much time it took for the light to reach to us on earth. So if we are seeing that far away, we will just see a little point. So for example, if there is a point uh, on in Delhi, you will see a point only. You won't see the point shape outside. So this is how we study. We study very, very far away gamma ray bursts. In fact, in 2010, I had studied one gamma ray burst, which was at a redshift of 8.3. What does that mean is that redshift of 8.3 corresponds to a time so currently our universe is around 14 billion years uh, of age. This burst uh, occurred when universe was only 650 million years old, less than a billion year. And that light, when the burst happened, that light, those photons reached to us in 2009, uh, 23rd April, 2009. And that's when we studied and we studied the environment of these bursts and um, you know, uh, energetics of these bursts. So, so these are really, really, really far away things and we are able to study them in multiple wave bands and try to understand the physics of these gamma ray bursts. Now let's come to something uh, even more exciting. So I told you that a rotating neutron star, for example, this is again our crab, uh, uh, is sitting inside a crab supernova uh, remnant. And if you look at the cartoon diagram of neutron star, since this neutron star is rotating very fast and the rotation axis is misaligned with the magnetic pole, we are seeing this flash of light and this is called a pulsar. So these neutron stars, one, they are extremely dense. If you take one sugar cube of this neutron star, that will out with the whole of earth with 7 billion people population and everything on earth. So this is how dense these neutron stars are. And these are just uh, 10 to 20 kilometer in, in size, uh, truly. So truly exotic objects. And these are inside the supernova remnants, uh, but there are some supernova remnants. Uh, so one can study these neutron stars because they're rotating very fast and they emit in radio bands. And GMRT has been in a lot of uh, discoveries and studies of a lot of these rotating neutron stars, which are called pulsars. But there are some uh, supernovae which will also, and or some gamma ray bursts which will also make black holes. Now, black holes don't emit light. So how do we study them? We have to find a different messenger to study them. So what happens? Black holes have very high gravity. I probably still have five minutes, yes. Black holes have this very high gravity. So the chances that they will attract another black hole are very high. And these two black holes come together and then these can merge. And this will still not produce light, but it will produce a lot of energy, but not in the form of light. It will produce as much as energy as 50 times all the energy in our universe currently, or roughly three suns annihilated in one second or something like that. But what happens, these mergers will produce gravitational waves, it means they will create these ripples in the space time, which means the space time will shrink and expand. And when it reaches Earth, the Earth will also shrink and expand. And then we have some these gravitational wave detectors on Earth. One of them I'm showing here is in uh, Livingston. So these are basically two arms of Michelson Mole interferometer. These are four kilometer arms. And you can see uh, these, uh, these, when the arms are four kilometer, 
then everything is in phase. But if the gravitational wave is passing through Earth, these are shrinking and expanding, and that is creating this pattern. And this is exactly the pattern uh, the advanced LIGO, the gravitational wave observatory saw, where they saw this pattern of merging two black holes. And that provided us for the first time a different messenger to directly study the black holes in our universe. And uh, so far, there was only a circumstantial evidence of black holes. But now, uh, sorry, now we have uh, these black holes to study in our uh, universe. And we have been able to do it because of gravitational waves. And uh, so now I will, so this is about the black holes, how to detect black holes with this experiment. And I will be telling us that we are also going to have one such experiment in India very soon. But let's come to another thing, even more exciting. And what happened in 2017 on 17th August? LIGO saw merger of two neutron stars. And exactly 1.7 seconds later, Fermi telescope, which is a gamma ray telescope in the sky, also saw a, a burst in the sky. This was the first time, and this remains the only and only object in our universe known to us, where uh, from the same source, gravitational waves have been seen and the light has been seen. And this was literally the watershed event, and it was not just detected with Fermi, it was also detected with um, X rays, optical, radio, and at least 4,000 astronomers across the globe studied this event. And this is the single most event with so many co authors in one single paper and the most studied event so far. And just because it was so exotic event, it had gravitational wave and light, it allowed us to test a lot of cosmological principles. For example, this, this burst told us because we have light and gravitational wave, so we can measure the speed of light. And we found that the gravitational waves travel with the speed of light uh, to very, very high accuracy. And since we have a measure of distance from two different means, we could also constrain, put constraints on the Hubble constant. Third thing is that if you see this uh, merger of two neutron star, it is not only creating black hole, it is also creating this light and this light, if you study the spectra and brightness, which you're seeing on the left, from this spectra, you can see a lot of elements which are being produced inside. Uh, what elements are there in this neutron star merger? And what we learned is that these neutron stars are so rich of uh, neutrons, and there is so much of uh, availability of neutrons that many of the heavier elements which supernovae could not make, for example, gold, platinum, all of these are being formed uh, in these neutron star mergers. So now this mystery is solved that supernovae cannot produce all heavy elements. These very, very heavy elements will be produced in these neutron star mergers. Third thing is, which we did in uh, radio bands. So what happens while we studied the gamma ray burst where massive star is giving rise to this gamma ray burst, Scientists had hypothesized for a very long time that when two neutron stars merge, they should also give rise to a gamma ray burst. It's a different kind of gamma ray burst, but it should happen. But there was no way to check it so far. And once this burst happened, it provided us to a way to check whether this theory is indeed true or not. And to understand this, we studied, uh, we collaborated with a lot of people and we studied these bursts with a lot of radio telescopes, these are all radio telescopes. We took the data in various different modes, light curves, spectra, very high resolution data. And finally, what we learned that while the jet was launched in this merger, this jet you can see on the right, the jet was moving through such dense medium that it lost a lot of its energy through the medium. And that medium became subrelativistic and came out first. And then after a delay of nearly uh, one and a half second or so, the jet was launched. So it means gamma ray bursts indeed get produced in the neutron star. But if jet doesn't have energy or if the medium is very, very dense, then there is a possibility that this merger will not launch gamma ray bursts. So while it has solved one mystery, it has created many, many, many more mysteries. 
but this is a very interesting event and this still remains the only event and we are trying to get a second one and then study and understand more physics from these events but i want to now uh, move a little bit and i want to tell you i want you to look at the top right, uh, left image and this our cosmology and with the help of lot of things which uh, included supernovae has told us that the matter which we are trying to study ordinary matter in all galaxies all stars on earth every single planet in between the galaxies everything is just around 5% uh one fourth of our universe is made up of dark matter which does not release photons or electromagnetic energy and 68% of our universe is made up of something called dark energy which we don't even have any clue about it should have a property of negative gravity because we now know that our universe is expanding not just expanding but accelerating so how do we study 96% of the universe which is not even producing electromagnetic radiation so we have to move to other than photons we have to move to different messengers and so today we have reached a stage in our understanding that we understand a huge part of our universe but there are much more which we don't understand and we have reached our limitations of studying uh the universe with of course optical telescope but even multi wavelength telescopes and we have to go to multi messenger and to all the youngsters here i want to tell you that we are at a very nice spot in this country to do a world class research in astrophysics because india is really this is this is really the golden time for the following reason one i already told you we have gmrt near pune and this is one of the most sensitive radio telescope in the world another telescope which is being built is a part of the telescope in south africa and part of the telescope in australia and this is such a huge expensive telescope that it is a multi country collaboration and india is part of this collaboration so very soon we will also be able to do much more science with radio telescope because we will have access to ska square kilometer array in optical telescope we already have a devastal telescope which is a 3.6 meter telescope in nainital and it's one of the largest in asia and then we also have a himalayan telescope in hangle and because of its extremely amazing weather this telescope is doing really really good science and then there is another uh, future mission which is under preparation and is called 30 meter telescope which means a mirror which will be a uh, total uh, size of the mirror will be 30 meter and this will be uh, nothing we have ever seen before again it is so expensive that this is a multi country collaboration and india is part of this uh, 30 meter telescope so one can one will be able to study the uh, uh, stars and other kinds of universe uh, astrophysical phenomena in optical band with this kind of telescope uh, we already have astrosat telescope which is a telescope revolving around the earth and this telescope has five instruments uh the telescope was built in tfr ayuka rri uh, raman research institute and it was launched in 2016 and it's doing really amazing science and then there is another uh, telescope called daksha it has been uh, the first stage has been approved by isro and in this telescope um, you one will be uh, as sensitive much more sensitive than astrosat will be more sensitive and it will be able to detect many more gamma ray bursts it's going to be a very very uh, uh, you know very very sensitive telescope when it comes up and hopefully it will come up in next 4 5 years and in multi messenger astronomy uh, i want to show you this plot on the left you are seeing the currently operational uh, gravitational wave detectors in yellow and the orange one which is ligo india which has been approved and hopefully it will be up by 2026 or so and then we have this great opportunity to gravitation wave science from india also and what ligo india is going to do is it will solve one of the biggest mystery currently the problem with gravitational waves is that if you see this blue uh, uh, areas these are the uncertainty and these are huge uncertainties in the positions of the gravitational wave just because of the location of india these uncertainties will become much much smaller and one will be able to look to with their telescopes for optical for x ray and radio counterparts of these telescopes 
So I want to end this talk here and I want to uh, say that we are really at a very interesting time where we can do a lot of science and astronomy is a science where, you know, there is no end to human curiosity. We are only bounded by our imagination, which is limitless. So there is so much to understand in the universe. And uh, I, and we are, uh, we are in, in this country right now, we are at a very good place to try to understand some of these mysteries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Uh, I think I can see a question in the chat box. There is a student asking what is the difference between a neutron star and a magnetar, magnet star. Yes, so uh, neutron star is, uh, magnetar is a neutron star, but it has thousand times more magnetic field than a neutron star. So neutron star typically has a magnetic field of around 10 to the power 12 Gauss and magnetar is of the order of 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 Gauss. And currently we don't understand why, it, uh, how does it get so much magnetic field, but, uh, but we have seen enough magnetars to know that this is the reality, this happens, these objects exist. Uh, let me just interject a bit. I think the participants can also raise the hand and we can then unmute them and they can ask the question directly. That is also possible. So uh, over to you, Sonali. I'm looking out for the students. Is they can raise hands. Yes, I see one raised hand. Yeah. Uh, Who is it? Yeah, Sumit Prakash. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, I have one question that uh, two neutron stars with glad that a uh, stranger is formed. If you know that uh, it is a fictional content, is a real a strange light. Sorry, I didn't understand. You can speak in Hindi, you can speak in Hindi. I didn't understand the question. As you told me, two neutron स्टार जो कोलाइड करते हैं उस समय जो गोल्ड और सिल्वर तो मैंने एक एक शो आता है मैम डिस्कवरी पे हाउ द यूनिवर्सवार उसमें मैंने देखा था कि एक पार्टिकल जो थ्योरेटिकल पार्टिकल है वो स्ट्रेंज लेट तो मैं वो रियली में अभी तक उसकी कुछ आ चुका है या फिर इज अ फिक्शनल कंटेंट ही अभी तक हां तो अभी तक ऐसी कोई डिस्कवरी नहीं हुई है बट बहुत सारी थ्योरीज हैं कि न्यूट्रॉन स्टार से क्या बनेगा मर्जर से मगर हम साइंटिस्ट जब तक हम किसी चीज को प्रूव नहीं कर लेते हम उसे बोलते नहीं है तो स्ट्रेंज स्टार इज वन ऑफ द थ्योरीज ऑफ मेनी अदर पॉसिबिलिटीज वी कैन इट कैन आल्सो मेक ब्लैक होल इट कैन मेक सम सुपरा मासिव न्यूट्रॉन स्टार इट कैन आल्सो मेक समवेयर इन बिटवीन और इट कैन मेक न्यूट्रॉन स्ट्रेंज स्टार सम पीपल से इट कैन आल्सो मेक समथिंग विद मेड अप ऑफ क्वार्क ग्लोन प्लाज्मा बट अभी तक ये सब हमें मालूम नहीं है अभी okay, तक प्रूव नहीं हुआ कुछ भी जी और मैम वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन में क्विजार्स के बारे में मैम क्विजार्स तो मैंने बताया नहीं बट हां पूछिए अगर मुझे आता होगा तो मैं बता दूंगी आपको जैसे मैम एक जो कंटीन्यूअली मैम ये गामा रे वजह आपने बोला कि मैम ब्लैक होल से जो जेट्स निकलते हैं वो कंटीन्यूअली ठीक मैम कैसे निकल सकते हैं आफ्टर अ लॉन्ग टाइम क्योंकि मैम जब भी मैंने पढ़ा था कि एक्रेशन भी घूमती है जब वो ज्यादा गर्म हो जाती तो जो मास है वो मैम ऊपर की तरफ स्पिन हो जाता है प्लाज्मा के रूप में दोनों अप साउंड डाइट मतलब नीचे और ऊपर की साइड तो मैम ये क्वेजार से मैम कितने टाइम तक चल सकता है तो क्वेजार्स काफी समय तक चलते हैं तो मैं आपको बताती हूं क्या होता है एक तो क्वेजार्स में बहुत बड़ा ब्लैक होल होता है मतलब ग्रेविटी बहुत ज्यादा है इट ट्राइंग टू अट्रैक्ट मैटर टू इट एज इट इज अट्रैक्टिंग ग्रेविटी बढ़ती जा रही है ना आपका जो इवेंट होराइजन रेडियस है उसके अंदर तो हमें फिजिक्स नहीं पता है बट इवेंट होराइजन के बाहर तो फिजिक्स काम करना है फिजिक्स के सारे लॉस फॉलो होंगे तो मतलब की जो मैटर गिर रहा है उसका एंगुलर मोमेंटम भी यू नो फॉलो होना है उसका मैग्नेटिक फील्ड भी तो वो सब एक कंफाइन हो जाता है दिस एक्शन डिस्क के परपेंडिकुलर जस्ट टू और बहुत ही फास्ट स्पीड से रोटेटिंग जेट निकल के आता है जस्ट टू कंजर्व द एंगुलर मोमेंटम और क्योंकि ब्लैक होल सुपर मासिव ब्लैक होल है बिलियन टाइम्स मास ऑफ अवर सन रफली इतना ज्यादा एनर्जी इतना ग्रेविटी है कि वो काफी समय तक ये रिलेटिविस्टिक पार्टिकल जेट निकाल सकता है गामा रिबर्स में कुछ सेकंड होता है बट क्वेजार्स में काफी समय होता है वो बढ़ता घटता रहता है उसका इंटेंसिटी क्योंकि अगर वो सडनली कोई पास में कोई छोटी सी गैलेक्सी आ गई पूरी गैलेक्सी खा गया तो बहुत सारी एनर्जी मिलेगी तो यू नो काफी सारा जेट निकलेगा तो उस तरह से होता है थैंक यू मैम जी
also need to know that all these are techniques to understand and find out exactly. I can't hear you properly. I don't know who is speaking. Um, can you try again? I'll just try to listen better. I think I, there I, was a uh, question by Arti. Arti's phone, it said so, but the question was typed so I can read out to you. What is the last stage in life of star? Do all stars end as black hole? Not all stars end as black hole. Sun will end as white dwarf. Uh, so that is the last stage of sun. Uh, then there will be uh, two to three, uh, four solar mass stars, which will also end as white dwarf, but these white dwarf will be bigger and more metal rich than the sun kind of white dwarf. Then the stars which are more than eight solar mass, they will end as neutron stars. And stars which are much, much, much bigger, they will end as uh, black holes. So this is the current understanding. Okay, uh, and that's how we understand things. And then there are stars which are less massive than sun. Suppose there is a star which is half the time of sun, uh, say, for, sorry, half the mass of sun, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 solar mass. That star has such a huge lifetime that that star has not lived its full life uh, in our universe lifetime. So it is still burning hydrogen into helium. So we don't know what will happen to that star. Um, if there are any more questions, we can wait. In the meantime, I have one question, Poonam. It's not sure. about uh, astronomy uh, because you have very beautifully covered it. And before I ask question, I'll say there have been also many, many appreciative comments about your illustrative uh, slides and also information both on the YouTube and uh, uh, in the Zoom chat box. Uh, my question is slightly uh, to you since you uh, you are the alumnus of this college and we are talking about International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Uh, you did mention about how uh, the teacher motivated you in uh, your teacher motivated you, but I thought maybe you could also add or expand a bit on um, something that was, let's say, was uh, steered you more into research or, uh, I, I, I mean, I, and maybe one of the challenging situations which you have faced. Okay. So I can say uh, the whole thing. Yes, I can. I can certainly tell in detail uh, or maybe no, not in detail, but in short. So, yes, I am from UP and uh, um, I think people uh, who are from UP, they can tell or I don't know if the situation is better now, but at that time, um, I think you're the main aim or at least, you know, you grow up with this, uh, everybody around you always told you at least to girls that, you know, uh, you are a nice girl, so you will marry a good, find a good groom. And this is how, you know, my life to around me was and, you know, be nice, be this, be that so that you find a good room. And then my father has this philosophy that, you know, um, do science, so dowry is less, <laughs> you know, that was another line of thought. So I think, that's the reason uh, he made me take science. Of course, I was very, very interested in science. And then, uh, as I said, Professor Roy, uh, you know, gave me those books and my interest developed toward uh, physics. I was really, really interested in math and physics both, but I was confused. And then I took physics and I was, I'm very glad I took. I also had op uh, opposite views, actually. When I wanted to uh, do PhD, uh, nobody in my family wanted me to do PhD and I have already told you Panna, that uh, you know I was uh, I was admitted to a law college so that I can do law and not PhD but I, I had to find my way out of law college and get into a PhD but even for PhD if I, even I was talking to some of the you know uh, uh, women scientists uh, professors they would ask my age and then they will count five years to that and then they will tell me oh, you are too old, <laughs> you will be too old to marry, so don't do PhD. So uh, I think, uh, <laughs> yes, so finding uh, my way out of this was slightly, you know, uh, there were challenges. Uh, I think what helped is that when I got admission in IISC, uh, after that, I think I was, since I was so interested and I was quite determined by the time and then Finally, I find, found my, and once I went, reached TFR for PhD, I think I was pretty clear that this is exactly what I wanted to do. Then there was no turning back, of course. 
but it was a long long road ahead <laughs> yeah thanks before. punam for sharing this uh, thing because i know these are personal but you know it's something which uh, as you know we have trodden the path but it also sort of uh, uh, gives a motivation to the people because i i think it's important uh, one thing is that people have the conception of the scientist which is yeah. somebody different but to see that you really we are all coming from the same pool and but, the same but uh, one problem. actually i want to say here one thing and unfortunately that professor is uh, uh, no more with us but in amu where i did my master there was one prof- so when i was doing my masters and as i think uh, sukhdev sir can also say the the dreams of tfr and iic are too big for us to even think of but at that time uh, this uh, professor at amu professor irfan he he saw my interest in physics he made me write a letter handwritten letter to tfr administration and asked me to send that letter and i never thought that anybody would respond but i wrote that letter because he literally was insisting every single day i sent it by post that i want admission in tfr and how do i get it because i had no clue and then i got a response from tfr in detail Uh, writing the process and how things happen and that is where i actually i allowed myself to dream that maybe it is possible to do phd at efr so i would say that was also a very important point in my life where you know uh, it was a step towards uh, dream becoming a reality so i really wanted to thank professor irfan also it's really wonderful that you shared this memory because i think it's uh... these few things like you know few motivating teachers and few turning points in the career these are important yeah right, thank you right. so much yeah yeah um, punam ma'am there is another question from a very uh, very uh, very hard working uh, student in our second year um, first year bsc he just got admitted and we have this uh, conference here which is called uh, towards Uh, the alba science of consciousness so they allow all the students this is what i'm trying to tell you that we've grown a lot we have ugra which is undergraduate research award which is for only undergraduates in science and the second thing is this dsc conference they uh, gave us a platform for students who can put up their posters on what what is what ideas do they have about future studying and everything So these these two groups in our first year they put up one of them put up a poster on supernovas without having any clue about it they just studied it for a week or so and then they were able to come up with an outline that's it and this girl she did it on I think it was on um, stars and uh, evolution of stars so she has a question what conclusions can we draw after observing a dying star closely. Okay, so one thing I'm doing, I have written my email address here. So the students who have moved uh, supernova poster, you're welcome to send mm-hmm. a PDF copy or uh, any copy of the poster to me, and I will be happy to have a look at it and respond to you. So if you want, you are feel free to contact me. So that is the first thing. Uh, second is that what is the uh, final stages of death of stars, right? Or could you repeat the question again? yeah and that's there in the chat what conclusions can we draw after observing a dying star closely <laughs> and what okay. conclusion we can draw is uh, right now we are at a stage the conclusion we can draw is that our universe is much more diverse than we can think of the stars are also very diverse and while we are saying that this kind of star will make neutron star this kind of star will make black hole but we still have to so when we are saying this what i am trying to do or what scientists or astronomers are trying to do is that they are assuming that the cow is spherical and with two eyes but i think what i am trying to say is that universe has not signed a pact with any body that it has to be simple the physics has to be simple physics is complex and as we, earlier we had many more unknowns and very few knowns and we were trying to build a very simple picture of the universe now we have less and less unknowns and more and more knowns and we can get into this little more complicated regime and try to understand the more important physics uh, which is driving our universe and these are very important com- uh, consequences of how we came to be and how things are going to evolve and that is what we are trying to understand and this is the conclusion we can drive that while we know at a very basic level that these stars are the one which are um, responsible for you know all these heavier elements 
uh, but just in 2017 we learned that not all the golden platinum all the golden platinum will be produced in neutron star mergers so we are still learning many many new things about our universe so we are far from concluding anything but our curiosity is increasing more than ever thank you so much uh, ma'am uh, it was a pleasure for all the students it was an eye opener for the students and it was a very informative uh, lecture and there were certain words that you given them to think about for the next week or so before they just and and of course the best part would was it was that you being a lady you were a big incentive to the girl students the girl students are the ones who are really the ones who get motivated with all these interactions thank you so much and i am sure the students also enjoyed and we are going to request you for more we are going to connect with you and we'll request you to interact more with the students and more with the ugra students that we are very good initiator sure i will be happy to do so in fact as i promised sir i will make a visit to di it's always great to come back to alma mater and you know <laughs> yeah hey, most welcome uh, poonam brilliant talk brilliant talk thank you very much for the talk and i would thank like you. to thank ipa for um, organizing this series of uh, you know colloquia the colloquia thank you very much wonderful thank you for hosting thank it we are really happy that it was very well attended also so i am yes. sure poonam will motivate dozens of students and uh, we hope definitely, to see definitely. more of the astronomers coming from the album yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you <laughs> thanks thanks thank, thank you. you i will stop yes. sharing now yeah i will uh, so stop much. the meeting now yeah thank you ma'am yeah. yes thank you thank